Hello, and welcome back to Compressible Flow. I'm Professor Steve Miller. Today we'll be talking about stagnation properties across normal shock waves. Previous class, we looked at the particular static values across normal shock waves. We'll then look at the variation of these values across normal shock waves, total and static values. We'll then return to entropy and look at how entropy changes across these shocks. We'll then return and examine the ideas of shock strengths, and indeed there's multiple ways to measure shock, shock strength. We'll also examine and derive the shock thickness estimated using classical theory. Then we'll look at a number of examples to illustrate the most basic normal shock wave calculations for your benefit. Let's get started. Let's start out with a fun quote. This one is by none other than William John McCorn Rankine in his introductory lecture on the harmonic theory and practice in mechanics on the second page in 1856. Dr. Rankine wrote, discrepancy is between theory and practice, which in sound physical and mechanical science is delusion, has a real existence in the minds of men, and that fallacy through rejected by their judgments, continues to exert influence over their acts. Let's get started on the variation of stagnation conditions in particular normal shock waves. So we previously developed properties for stagnation or total conditions with an isentropic flow. These same properties might hold before and after a shock if the flow is isentropic before and after the shock. But we also showed in our previous class that this the entropy rises across a shock. So we'll seek the stagnation properties across stationary normal shock waves and account for the change in entropy. This is a very strange concept, so we're going to apply our isentropic theory to the shock wave problem where we know that delta s, the rise of entropy across the shock, must be greater than zero. Let's get started with these concepts. So you see, in this particular problem, in figure 135, I wrote the stagnation before a shock. So we know that the entropy increases across a shock. So we'll just imagine we can apply our isentropic theory before the shock first, and then after the shock separately. Now we know m1 must be greater than 1, so we'll write m1 greater than 1 as an assumption because we're before the shock. Now each particular fluid element will be in its real state that is M1, P1, T1, and S1. That's the actual fluid properties. And we'll imagine that if we take a little fluid parcel that is a fluid differential element before the shock and instantaneously deaccelerate it to Mach 0, we'll find some imaginary state for element 1A before the shock. And we bring it to rest in our imagination isentropically. Then in state 1a, we would have a corresponding total pressure and total temperature, just like we would stagnate all the other variables. So at any point in the flow, before the shock and after the shock, just before the wavefront, we can bring to rest isentropically and find the corresponding stagnation values from the static values before the shock and M1 before the shock. And so we know the stagnation conditions right before the shock occurs at the face of the shock wave. We can also do the same for subsonic flow, which corresponds to the flow right after the wavefront of the standing normal shock wave. Here, once again, we have M2. And remember, M2 indeed must be less than 1, as we proved in the previous class, for, of course, the second law of thermodynamics to hold. In this case, we have m2, t2, s2, p2, rho2, u2, whatever quantity we want. And we can use the Mach number m2 and say the static thermodynamic values to find the stagnation quantities, say po2, to2. So the sub naught or o signifies the stagnation condition, and the sub 2 means the quantity after the shock, that is state 2. We bring these flows to rest isentropically isentropically in our imagines instantaneously right before and after the shock front. And so we have the real values and we have the stagnation values. Certainly the flow is not stagnating after or before the wave front, which would actually be impossible. Because of course you have a finite Mach number, as we showed through asymptotic analysis in the previous class. 
let's look at some of this analysis through mathematics. We'll pose the question, how does the total temperature after the normal shock wave compare to the total temperature in front of the shock wave? And to do this, we'll look at a particular energy equation. We might also ask how do these properties, other total conditions, compare across the shock wave, but we'll look at total temperature first. Let's recall our energy equation from a calically perfect glass, gas, which we looked at in the previous classes. We have repeated in this slide deck of 333 equation, C sub P T1 plus U1 squared over 2 equals C sub P T2 plus U2 squared over 2. Remember, the definition are the total or stagnation temperatures. We can immediately write in 333 that U1 is perhaps equal to zero. Now, of course, U1 is not equal to zero in front of the shock, but we're, in our imagination, remember, letting it stagnate. You'll see now we can write C sub P T naught equals C sub P plus C1 squared over two. We can apply this to both sides. For example, we would set U1 equal to zero and T2 equal to zero. So for a calculated perfect flow through a steady normal shock, the total temperature in front of the shock is equal to the total temperature after the shock. So for stationary normal shocks, the total temperature in the flow is conserved even though the flow is not isentropic. That's an amazing fact. And it's important to remember that to solve problems, of course, in the class. Now let's consider the total enthalpy. So since the total temperature is conserved across the shock, what happens to the total enthalpy? Remember our perfect gas, calorically perfect flow assumption, P equals rho RT, and also H equals C sub PT. Also, the total conditions hold using the relation of stagnation conditions. And so we can write, as I shown in the text above, that H naught, the stagnation enthalpy, equals C sub P times the stagnation temperature. So using this relation, H naught equals C sub P T naught in 335, and make a substitution, we can write then, of course, H01 equals HO2. That's the stagnation enthalpy across a standing normal shock is indeed conserved. Now these relations, TO1 equals TO2 across the shock and HO1 equals HO2 across the shock are not true if the following, and many more things happen actually, if the flow is chemically reacting, that is say there's reactions or combustion or something, combustion chemistry, if the flows are thermally perfect, which is a relaxation assumptions from our current assumptions, or if the shock wave is moving or non-stationary. And that's why we will treat in this class moving shock waves separately from standing shock waves. But you'll see for moving shock waves, that is where they move in space relative to the observer, will have to be treated and some of these assumptions will be the same and result in the same equations and some will be very much different. And you'll see in this particular case, this relation in 336 breaks down. And so the shock wave has to be standing and not moving in space and time, that is uh, with respect to the observer. Let's now look how entropy and pressure might be changed in total values for this particular standing normal shock wave you'll see that we have previously shown that the stagnation temperature is conserved. Therefore, we can write it as TO2 over TO1 equals 1. Let's say I just divided the equation for stagnation temperature across the shock by TO1. That was easy. Now we might want to return and look at our entropy equation. Remember, the delta S equals C sub P with the logarithm of the total the temperatures minus R times the logarithm of the pressures. And so we can write through the simplification, a delta S goes as negative R of the natural log of PO2 over PO1. The natural log of TO2 over TO1 is one, therefore it's zero. So the first term on the right-hand side of the entropy relation is simplify the 338 by dropping the temperature variation. And so our entropy change across a standing normal shock can be related to the stagnation pressures as 
negative r of natural log of PO2 over PO1. This is a much, much, much simpler relation than the one we previously derived with respect to Mach number of static values. We can then solve for the stagnation pressure ratio in 38 and rewrite it as 339 with an exponent. It'll be PO2 over PO1 equals the E to the negative delta S over R, simple. So you can see it's very much clear that the total or stagnation pressure decreases a shock across a shock wave are related to entropy and vice versa. These equations that I've shown up to this point, that is the Mach number relations and total pressures are tabulated in the famous Ames tables for gamma 1.4 and other values of gamma. In the class handout, I've developed the Mach number standing relations for thermodynamic variables against M1 in the tables, and we'll show those in the one-on-one -on -one sessions. So here we have a general relationship, which is shown on your formula sheets. Look up your tables for Mach shock waves standing shock waves. And these hold for all flows in this particular course, not just normal shocks. And you'll see that we have delta S over R, the gas constant, equals the negative log of PO2 over PO1. So if you know PO2 over PO1, you can simply and easily find delta S or vice versa. In the tables, I've listed PO2 over PO1 for, of course, standing normal shocks. PO2 over PO1 is found numerically in practice by stagnating the values of pressure using M and of course P1 and T respectively. And you saw the shock solving for the stagnation values and taking their ratio and going through negative log of PO2 over PO1 to find of course the delta S change. You also showed that the stagnation pressure must always decrease across a normal shock wave. Why is that? Well, look at equation 340. You know that the left-hand side must always be positive. S2 minus, minus S1 must always be positive because S2 is greater than S1 to have the second law of thermodynamics be true. R is always a positive constant. So the left-hand side is positive. Therefore, the right-hand side is must be positive. Since there's a negative in front of the log, you must have PO2 less than PO1, so that we'll have a negative times a negative of the evaluation of the natural log. In this case, the right-hand side will become positive, and the equation can, of course, be balanced through its equal equality. Excuse me. So the amount of the decrease of the total pressure you can see through 340 is actually a measure of the increase across a shock wave. That's why it makes a lot of sense to talk about the total pressure loss across a shock wave because you're also talking about the entropy gain through this simple relation. So the entropy increase across a shock wave is another effective measure of the strength of the shock. And perhaps for the first time in many students' academic careers, they can have a very physical feeling for entropy gain through total pressure relations or pressure relations because of the shock wave problem. That's beautiful. Now in isentropic flow, remember the delta S is constant and therefore requires that PO2 equals PO1. Now let's take a break from the mathematical analysis and look at how the thermodynamic variables and one total variable not enthalpy, of course, total, in, total enthalpy and total temperature because they're constant across the shock, they just be a constant in the graph, varies with various properties of shock. So here's a very famous graph. This is the variation of the field variables with M1, and let's take a few minutes to understand it and understand the physics of the thermodynamic and fluid dynamic changes across a shock. On the x-axis, we have Mach number. M1. M1 is the Mach number in front of the standing normal shock, and we'll let it vary from 1 through 4 on a linear scale. So M1, 1, 2, 3, 4, from left to right on the curve. We have two y-axis. The left axis is a graph from 0 to 1. It is, law, it is linear, excuse me, a linear scale at 0.1 increment, and 
on the right, we'll have the ratios, the static values, T2 over T1, P2 over P1, and Rho2 over Rho1. So let's look first how M2 varies with M1, because that was the first equation we derived. If M1 equals 1, then of course M2 will be equal to 1, which we found to be true through our asymptotic analysis. And we show that as M1 becomes very, very large to infinity, it goes to a value about M2 0.378 for gamma 1.4. Indeed, it has a sharply decreasing slope and then it starts to level out, and asymptotically, if we let m1 go to infinity, it would approach a particular value, depending on the value of gamma. Let's now look at the stagnation pressure difference, PO2 divided by PO1. If m1 equals 1, you can see from the previous equation we derived that, of course, PO2 equals PO1, and that's why we have 1 at m1 equals 1. We'll have PO2 divided by PO1 equals 1. If we increase M1, that's the Mach number from the shock, it once again sharply decreases and goes to extremely, extremely low values. And you can see, therefore, that the total pressure loss across a shock is huge, even for mild values of M1. This means if we have a normal shock in the flow, there's huge increases of entropy and very, very large and unfortunate losses of total pressure. Remember, total pressure is one of the most important quantities in compressible flow because it's what drives the flow from, say, a plenum in a rocket through its exhaust and the kinetic energy, and we would lose potential Mach number. Therefore, it's often disadvantage, a big disadvantage to have a normal shock wave in our flows because there are huge potential losses of energy. Let's now look at the thermodynamic values. In our asymptotic analysis, recall that we showed that both the pressure ratios and temperature ratios go to infinity as M1 goes to infinity. Indeed, if M1 is equal to 1, then all ratios of thermodynamic values across a standing normal shock wave will be 1. So if we look at 1 on the right-hand side, because that's the axis, we can move our cursor across and indeed see it's a value of 1. So ratio of thermo thermodynamic values on the right axis, you can see there's a value of 1, which they are. Now let's look at the pressure. As we let m go to infinity, the static pressure will go to infinity, and if we let, of course, the temperature ratio go with m1 go to infinity, we'll find the temperature ratio go to infinity, but just at a much slower pace. And so we'll see for all normal shocks for calorically perfect gases, the pressure ratios are also much, much greater and rise much, much faster than temperature, according to our analysis. Recall asymptotically as m1 goes to infinity, then the ratio of densities asymptotically goes to a ratio of about 6. Indeed, here at only Mach 4, we're already about value of 4.5. And so we're already raising the density of the fluid after the shock in Mach 4 by a factor of 4.5. So take a few minutes and understand how physically these values change through various Mach numbers of the shock. Of course, we could also plot the values of M1 less than 1, but remember that would just violate the second law of thermodynamics, and so we'll just skip that. It's just interesting from a thermodynamic theoretical point of view. Let's now look at the value of M2 a little bit more closely with M1. This is the same graph that we previously showed, but here in this case, I've shown the values of M1 less than 1. You'll see on the x-axis we have Mach number, and on the y-axis we have M2, the Mach number after the shock. So at M1 equals 1, we have M2 equals 1, and we can let M1 go up to 5, and you can see how it levels off really quickly. For M1 less than 1, which violates our second law of thermodynamics, you can see it rises up to a barrier. So of course M2 for M1 less than 1 becomes very, very large. And so the shock wave would accelerate the flow, which is of course physically impossible. What we haven't shown is a graph of the change of entropy across the shock. So here I've shown one in my own writing, and you can see why I like to graph and plot things, where we have an x-axis of M1. I put three values, 0.5, 1, and 1.5. On the y-axis, we have delta S. So if M1 equals 1, we have a delta S of 0. At M1, 1.5, we have a positive delta S, and it almost looks like a slowly rising curve. For M1 less than 1, which is physically impossible, it, the curve of S2 minus S1 goes down sharply, and we would have large entropy uh, losses, or excuse me, we would have large entropy losses across the shock, which of course is physically impossible. 
To the right, we have large entropy gains, and of course entropy always rises through the system, which in this case is a differential shock, standing and normal, which is true. Let's move on. Here's another graph of the particular case, and you can see in this version, figure 140, we have an increase at M1, just like on the previous slide, and then delta S on the y-axis. For gamma 1.4, we've plotted from M1 to 3, the rise in entropy. That makes sense. And for this way of looking at it, I need to make the note that typically people talk about strengths of shocks, just like any other quantity, but it's usually done through either delta S, PO2 over PO1, P2 over P1, or M1. So you can talk about a normal shock strength as just saying it's incoming Mach number. If it's very high, it's probably a very, very strong shock. And most probably, most people talk about shock wave strength as, say, P2 over P1 or as say like a pressure rise. So they might say it's an atmospheric rise of pressure across the normal shock, right? So that would be maybe say P2 over P1 goes as one atmosphere increase, which would be a factor of two from standard conditions. So you'll get used to talking about shock strengths this way through industry and of course the compressible flow community. What we haven't done up to this point is find a relation of PO2 over PO1 as a function of M1. Let's try that now. So we early, earlier in this class found and looked at the ratio of PO2 over PO1 as a function of entropy. That is, remember, PO2 is the stagnation pressure after the shock, and PO1 is the stagnation pressure in front of the shock. We know from our analysis on the second law that PO2 must be less than PO1, that there's a total pressure loss through the shock. But we want to seek it as a function of M1, like our other uh, ratios for standing shocks. So let's return to, of course, the momentum equation, which was P1 plus rho one u1 squared equals P2 plus rho two u2 squared. Now let's use the energy equation for a perfect gas via the relation of C goes to the square root of gamma P over rho, which we previously derived, and we'll find 343. And we can write P plus rho u squared star, the critical velocity, at, which is the velocity at the speed of sound, excuse me, the velocity, the critical velocity at the shock, which is which is not the speed of sound, of course, will go as p plus one plus gamma m squared. We can now combine 342, 343, and find this particular equation 344. I've done this work for you, and it's p1 plus one plus gamma m1 squared is p2 one plus gamma m2 squared. We haven't got much closer, but we can once again look for the ratios of pressures. Let's solve for the ratio of static pressures. We have P2 over P1 goes as 1 plus gamma M1 squared over 1 plus gamma M2 squared. So once again, we've used the critical conditions to cross the shock, which are conserved. Now we previously derived that static pressure ratio and we can combine it with Mach number relations. Remember our Mach number relation across the shock is M2 squared goes as M1 squared over 2 gamma 2M1 all over M1 squared times 2 gamma over gamma minus 1 minus 1. Let's find our pressure ratio equation from 345 using this note and we'll find that P2 over P1 will go as gamma 2 gamma M1 squared over gamma plus 1 minus gamma minus 1 over gamma plus 1. So look at 346 and 345. You can see very clearly that we used M2 and replaced it to find an M1 relation on the right hand side and that's how we obtained 346. Now let's use something like a chain rule or a multiplication of fraction and come so we can cancel out factors. So we could write, just write down P over two over P over one, and we can write that as P over two over P two times P two over P one times P one over P over one. You can see from the first and second and second and third uh, factors on the right hand side of 347, that indeed I could cross out P2s and P1s and find PO2 over PO1 equals P over 2 over PO1. So I've just inserted P2 over P1 and P1 and P2 in the numerator and denominator respectively of the first and third term on the right hand side to obtain this function. I've constructed it. 
if you will. But I've done that, as you can see, now I have an explicit term in the second term on the right-hand side of P2 over P1. I can replace that with 346 if I desire. I also know the relations PO2 over P2 and P1 over P01. How do I know those? Well, those are simply from isentropic flow theory. P02 over P2 is related to the Mach number after the shock and gamma, and P01 divided by P1, the third term on the right-hand side, is in, related to the Mach number in front of the shock, M1 and gamma. Let's insert the isentropic relations for the first and third term and 346 of the second term. After simplifying, we'll get 348. And we'll find PO2 over PO1, you can see now, is a function of M2 in the first term and M1 in the second and third terms. We can now substitute once again our relation for M2 as M1, which is shown on the top of 445, right here, into the first term on the right-hand side. I will now simplify this equation as much as I can and box it. And you can see now I have a closed form expression for the Mach number in front of the shock only. And gamma is a constant, which is the ratio of Cp over Cv. So now I found a closed form expression for PO2 over PO1. This is the relation between a stagnation pressure loss across the normal shock wave, which is stationary in perfect gases. You must remember, if you use this equation, all the assumptions we used. This equation is also summarized in the Ames tables and the tables I handed out in this class and the compressible flow calculators that numerically find values online as a function of M1. It's a large equation. It's almost worth finding independently P1, M1 to find PO1 through isentropics or P2 and PO2 and M2 through isentropics, the same equation, just with different subscripts. Or you can directly evaluate this if you have no other option. Now, let's talk about the particular errors of these equations. You'll note that the ratio, the stagnation pressure across the normal shock wave, can be written directly as a function of M1 and gamma. It will be very, very difficult to see the behavior of these normal shocks, especially when they are jump conditions, and look at them by examining the equations themselves. Let's plot them, indeed. In later classes, we'll examine the so-called rankine hugonio relationships between pressure and density. But for now, let's just note in equation 350 of the slide deck what the current rankine hugonio equation is. The rankine hugonio equation relaxes the assumptions of perfect gases, and therefore we can look at the air. Remember, we'll derive the rankine hugonio form of the shock equations later, which relax assumptions. So, on the right, I have a graph of row 2 over row 1 across a shock, and it goes from 1 to 10. And on the y-axis, I have a ratio of pressures, P2 over P1. You'll note, indeed, that they're both logarithmic, P, row 2 over row 1. You'll also see that P2 over P1 has a much bigger logarithmic scale. On the top x-axis, I have m1 from 1 to say 5 and then infinity. So you'll see as m1 goes to infinity, we can go down the line on the right and indeed find row 2 over row 1 is 6, which is true of course to ranking hugonio theory. If we only use isentropics for the shock waves, then of course there'd just be an extension line if there's no shock wave indeed for various Mach numbers. So a log-log scale actually draws a straight line in the curve for the relation of pressures and densities. What happens in the shock wave in reality is it rises up like a barrier and goes to infinity as we approach M16 or the density ratio of 6. You can see P2 over P1 has a huge increase. And of course this graph is for gamma 1.4. You'd have different graphs but it's different asymptotics too for different values of gamma. Now we generally consider a shock wave to be weak if the incoming Mach number is less than 1.4. That is, you can see, if Mach number is less than 1.4, which is about here, then the so-called isentropic theory and the shock wave theory are very, very, very close. And so we call these weak, we call these weak normal shock waves, even though they have an entropy rise, of course. So at say Mach 1.4, incoming Mach number of the shock, the total pressure loss is only approximately 5% across the shock wave, the total pressure loss, stagnation or total pressure. 
Whereas at say Mach 1 equals 3 up here, we can go down and see there's a larger difference in the curves and you see that there's actually a loss of about 67% of total pressure, which is huge. So from only Mach 1 to 1.4 to 3, there's even there's this huge loss. And you can see why we consider these theories nonlinear. A normal shock wave, say at Mach 1, will be vanishingly weak. And we see that in the particular graph on the right, where the losses down near M1 equals 1, and small density increases, and small pressure increases, are very, very small. And so we call those vanishingly weak shock waves. Strong shock waves that are normal could be considered larger than Mach 1.4, according to the analysis. Let's now take a few minutes and look at the compressible aerodynamics calculator. Once again, we can return to the web page of Compressible Aerodynamics Cal Calculator at Virginia Tech or look at the version I've posted on the class website. You can see there's a subfield called Normal Shock Relations. Up here, we can put in gamma, which is 1.4 for error, and we can put in if a drag down list of, say, some input value. You can only input one value because all other quantities we derived are functions of other quantities. In this case, you might put in M1 of 2. So that means the Mach number in front of the standing normal shock wave is 2. You can then push calculate, and of course, it'll just evaluate our algebraic equations, which we developed, which are nonlinear, and find all the other quantities. For example, M2 will be 0 0.577. Stagnation pressure, 0 0.7208. Stagnation versus static pressure after the shock and in front of the shock is 0 0.177. And we'll see why this quantity is important later in the class. Pressure rise of 4.5. Density rise of 2.66. And temperature ratio, 1.6875. So that's very interesting, but we can also use a pull down menu from here and type in any other quantity in the list. For example, we could put an M2 and put an M2 on the right, and of course 2 wouldn't be a proper value. Say we could say M2 of 0.5 and hit calculate and we'll find once again all the other values. So that's an easy way to check your homework and to do fast calculations, but of course you won't have access to the calculator on say like a midterm, um, so it's a good way to check homework. You can also use the tables. I suggest getting used to the equations and tables, and most importantly, and using calculators like numerical calculators as a backup. Here's a picture, of course, from the famous NASA Ames tables. You'll see a number of columns. And in this case, these are for supersonic flows only. This, of course, a normal shock wave requires a supersonic Mach number in front of it. And so the leftmost column is the most important column. It says M or M1. So we can go down the list and indeed see we have Mach number from 1 to 1.24. It's the same as the tables in the handout. And you see certain values which we actually derived before. But over here on the right, here are the shock values. Here's M2. Starting from this column are normal shock values for, of course, the Ames tables. So M2, you see, for M1 is 1. And as we increase Mach number in front of the shock, the Mach number after the shock goes down. Look at the ratios of pressures and densities and temperatures, P2 over P1, rho 2 over rho 1, and T2 over T1. You can see they all increase with increasing Mach number M1 in front of the shock. Finally, you see the total pressures, PT2 over PT1. So the Ames tables use T instead of not to denote total or stagnation pressures. And you can see indeed this is going down. Finally, you have P1 over PT2, which we'll talk about later in this class for, of course, Rayleigh pitot 2 formula, which is coming up. Let's now look at one particular example to illustrate the most basic example of standing normal shockwave theory. Let's read this together to understand it and dissect and understand the problem. Remember, one of the hardest parts of engineering is simply understanding the problem. So don't read too carefully and take your time and make sure you really understand it. It says a normal shock wave is standing, that means it's at rest relative to the observer, in the test section of a supersonic wind tunnel. So we have a supersonic wind tunnel and somewhere there's a normal shock wave in it. That means the flow in front of the shock wave is supersonic. And say we are able to measure or know the upstream values from the shock. It says the upstream value of the shock wave, we're able to measure with a probe perhaps, M1 equals 3, P1 equals a half atmosphere, and T1 equals 200 Kelvin. 
This is a relatively normal type flow. So the Mach number is three, the pressure is a half atmosphere, and the temperature is 200 Kelvin. And we even put in subscripts one to tell you those are the values in front of the shock. And we're asked to simply find the Mach number after the shock, M2, the pressure, temperature, and velocity after the shock. So that's just the location exactly after the shock front. So from a few mean free paths, we've gone from M1 of three, pressure and temperatures, to some other values just across a few mean free paths of the flow. Let's try it out. So this solution is the easiest one to do for normal shock wave theory. We can use the tables or equations that we have derived. Try out the equations for yourself and then check your results with the tables and the calculator for this particular problem to make sure you understand how to do it. We can simply look up M1 equals 3, and you'll find from the developed equations the static pressure ratio, the static temperature ratio, as 10.33 and 2.679 respectively. You'll then also find from M2 equals M1 equation, or the tables, say we look up 3 in the axis, the left axis of the table, which is below here, you can look up M2 for instance or use the equations. And indeed, you'll find a value of 0 0.4752. So this is a rather strong standing normal shock in our wind tunnel. Now that we know those ratios, we can multiply them by our known quantities, say a half atmosphere and 200 Kelvin, and we'll find a static pressure after the shock of 5.165 atmospheres. So our shock wave has caused our pressure to go from 0.5 atmosphere to 5 atmosphere. That's a factor of 10 increase which of course is shown in the ratio. The static temperature has gone up by approximately 335.8 Kelvin, which is a huge temperature difference, which is basically across a discontinuity in our flow. Now we want to find the velocity. We've already found Mach number after the shock. That's 0 0.4752. We'll have to find velocity. We'll use our Mach number relation. Here it is M2 equals U2 over C2. We don't know what C2 is. That's the speed of sound after the shock. But remember, the speed of sound is related to temperature. So we can write C2 equals the square root of gamma R T2. We replace T2, 535.8 Kelvin here under the square root. R is 287 and gamma is 1.4. Doing the math, we get 464 meters per second. Can you also find C1? Here you'll see now that we know U2, excuse me, we know M2, and we know C2, we can solve for U2. U2 equals, of course, M2C2. So we would multiply 0 0.4752 for M2 with 464 meters per second from the speed of sound, and we'll get 220 meters per second. Indeed, relative to U1, and I encourage you to calculate yourself, the speed has indeed reduced. Note how we constructed our solutions with ratios multiplied by known values. You can also seek out stagnation value like T0 to cross the shock or critical condition like C soup start across the shock. But you can see we've developed our equations because most shock problems involve formulations with respect to M1. Sometimes if you know there are other thermodynamic values, you'd actually have to use iterative methods, that is computational methods, to solve the equations because you can't find closed form analytic solutions. You can find analytic equation. Let's now talk about a rather difficult topic, which is, of course, shock wave thickness. We now want to estimate the thickness of these standing normal shock waves mathematically using dimensional analysis and a few other little tidbits. We will consider this question, and it has to involve the dissipated effects that account for the increase in the shock. Now you'll note that for inviscid flows, technically the shock thickness is zero. But of course the actual equations of motion in almost all liquids, gases, and plasmas have some kind of compressibility. So in the absence of viscosity and heat conduction, the compression waves will tend to become inf infinitely steep and form a discontinuity in the solution. This is really unphysical in reality when we solve the earlier equations for these particular flows. So our analysis will need to understand this result in the form of the equations of motion, which only contain the pressures and inertial forces. As these waves become very, very steep due to the pressure and inertial forces, there has to be something balancing them so they won't become infinite in reality. Their balancing forces are, of course, the viscous stresses. 
and these viscous forces become very much appreciable for very, very, very large gradients in the flow. And you can see that, of course, in the equations in motion. So no matter how small the viscosity is, and it's rather small in most fluids, um, especially gases like air relative to the other forces, this will cause this balancing force to become rather large in terms of viscosities. Nonetheless, the heat conduction effects must also become substantial to balance out this large pressure rise from letting the solution go to infinity, no matter how small the thermal conductivity is. So you see in reality there must be some adiabatic effects going on in the fluid parcel as it moves through the shock. So these are our physical arguments which we observe from nature. Now as viscosity and heat conduction effects will wipe out this discontinuities, that is if you look at the diffusion equation of partial differential equations, you see it has the effects of diffusing the flow. And that's very much what's happening with the viscous and heat conduction equation or terms in the equations of motion. Therefore they resist the steepening from the inertial forces. The steepening of the shock wave is actually controlled by viscosity and heat condition, uh, conduction effects themselves. That is, it does actually have a finite slope in all other derivatives because, of course, it is in a continuum, according to our analysis. So in a compression wave, that is a shock wave, has reached a particular stationary form, then there'll be some sort of spreading influences from the viscosity and heat conduction, which are being balancing by the pressure and inertial forces. Therefore, in our magnet order of magnitude analysis of the equations of motion, which I'll show momentarily, well, we should be balancing these particular forces across the equations of motion. So we'll try and apply an order of magnitude analysis for the particular shock wave thickness. We'll estimate the order of magnitude through the shock wave thickness by balancing these terms. And in particular, there'll be a stationary form of pressure viscous inertial forces through the equations of motion. And we'll equate them and replace the terms through the order of magnitude analysis and balancing on them in this fashion. Let's try that out. So here I've shown a graph, figure 144, which might depict the shock wave thickness. So on the top y-axis we have velocity, on the x-axis we have of course x, and we might graph the shock wave in this fashion. And we'll just say the thickness of the shock goes as little delta, which is shown right here. And before and after the shock we'll have some velocities vx and vy. Now remember the velocity must be reduced across the normal shock wave in the flow direction as we proved and shown in our previous equations for standing normal shock. So we're estimating the thickness delta as a line drawn through the middle of the shock which connects the Vx and Vy, the velocity before and after the shock. And so we're estimating and defining our shock thickness in this way. In reality the curve and the distance between Vx and Vy is finite, but very, very large, and the distance delta is extremely, extremely small in the order of 10 to the negative seventh or smaller meters. So you can see this graph is not really drawn to scale because you wouldn't be able to even see delta on the graph. It would just look as like a solid line with very, very large distances between Vx and Vy. So let's try this out through a combination of dimensional analysis and asymptotics. Let's start with the particular change in velocity, which occurs in a very, very short distance. And we'll define the character shock thickness as delta. So using the previous graph and arguments I just made, I will write equation 335 in this slide deck. And we'll just say that the shock wave thickness goes as something like the change in velocities across the shock, all divided by the derivative dv dx, the maximum derivative, which is of course related to this slope, which I'm showing with my cursor. Dv dx. Let's check the dimensions of equation 35 to see if my argument works. In the numerator we have dimensions of meters per second, and in the denominator we have the dimensions of meters per second per meter. Therefore, our dimensions on the right hand side are meters, which of course goes along with delta, which should be measured in meters. Now, let's pull out from the Navier-Stokes equations, the axial, that is the stringwise equation, and we'll write down only the forces 
which balance the flow. On the right hand side, we've shown the convection term of the compressible Navier Stokes equation. On the left hand side, we show the viscous equation. And we simplified it out so that, of course, the derivatives in the cross stream directions are zero because we're handling a stationary normal shock wave, which is good. And we'll try and balance the left and right hand sides. So on the left, the viscous terms will go as 4 thirds mu times d derivative with respect to x and dv dx will be balanced by, for a shock wave phenomena, as rho times v dv dx. Now we'll try and evaluate the derivatives in the order of magnitude fashion. And we'll say, just for simplicity, that 4 thirds is approximately 1 because we're doing it's an order of magnitude 1, so that's fine. And we'll have, we'll replace the left hand side and right hand side with, of course, its finite difference approximation. We'll have a delta v over delta goes as a delta v over delta, which goes along with our graph in figure 144. Try it out yourself. Now you can find by rearrangement and look at that the Reynolds number of the shock will go as rho v delta over u. This is a classic definition of Reynolds number, that the density times the velocity times the length scales all over viscosity mu will be on one. So this means that the Reynolds number of the shock is based on the thickness and the fluid properties at a particular temperature is on the order of unity. This should be clear from our analysis. Now we can try introduce the kinetic energy theory of gases and we'll find showing by the order and magnitude and the kinetic theory of gases of usually a graduate class like gas dynamics and we can try and show that the thickness of the shock divided by the link scale the mean molecular path will go as 5 eighths times the Reynolds number of the shock. So using this relation, we can observe that it's very much clear that the shock thickness is on the order of few mean free paths. It's also clear that thermodynamic equilibrium does not prevail in the shock, and the analysis of the shock from the continuing considerations is at best given approximate values from the shock structure. So we'll see that the kinetic theory or even quantum mechanics will be necessary for further analysis of the problem. So we're in a conundrum. Now let's look at the shock structure and the structure of the shock waves by solving the exact Navier-Stokes equations for the particular problem. This is more accurate in our analysis, and this analysis is shown by Shapiro and Klein in their journal article. And they developed the following formula for the shock thickness as a function of other variables using the full Navier-Stokes equations and not our general uh, dimensional analysis. And they show that density times the speed of sound times delta divided by mu of x, and here x is the values just in form of the shock will go as this large function involving Mach number. And here d, d is nothing but a function of gamma Mach number and Prandtl number, which is a constant, usually about 0.72 in that range for the particular flow of interest. And it's nothing but an exponent in the viscous temperature relation of mu equals t to the n. And so this is a closed form expression that accurately measures shock thickness. Now for very weak shocks, we might be able to take this equation, because of course it's weak, and simplify it to this particular form. It shows that the thickness of a weak shock wave is indeed inversely proportional to the strength of the shock. So we can see that as the shock wave strength decreases, the thickness of the shock increases. We might measure and quantify the strength of the shock wave to go as the Mach number in front of the shock, minus one. So extremely weak shock waves have very, very, very large thicknesses at standard pressures and temperatures according to the analysis of Shapiro and Klein. Let's look and use dimensional analysis which we developed, not Shapiro and Klein's typical formulas, here, 359, and look at typical shock strengths. The second column is the Mach wave in front of the shock. The fourth column is the thickness divided by the free path length. So for example, a Mach number in front of a standing normal shock of 1.5 has a thickness of approximately four free mean paths. And Mach 10, the number of mean free paths goes down to the about of order two. At infinite Mach number, of course, this analysis breaks down. Let's look at a graph of particular shock wave thickness. On the x-axis is the value in inches times 10 to the fifth, 
and on the y-axis is the velocities in front of the shock and after the shock respectively. So this shows the thickness of a compression shock at normal standard atmospheric pressures and temperatures. You can see, indeed, how the variation of densities and temperatures and velocity goes across the shock in terms of our original graph and analysis, according to the theory, in terms of inches of 10 to the fifth. So it's rather small. There's one more interesting diagram which I want to show with respect to the thermodynamics of these particular shock waves. And we'll talk about the so-called rally flow and fano flow later in the class. Say we go from state x to y. So x is in front of the shock and y is after the shock, or some other thermodynamic process. It's the state of the system before and after. The x-axis is entropy, and so the y-axis is temperature. This represents a typical temperature entropy diagram. So you can see in this particular flow, x goes from to y and entropy increases. The temperature also increases. Now, the path of a normal shock follows the very dark black line. And so if we increase the temperature, if we track temperature and entropy for higher and higher shock strengths, we can trace out the black line. You can do that through the equations you developed in this class. Now there are two particular flows. There's Rano flow and Fano flow. Rowley flow is a flow where there's heat addition, and Fano flow is where there's frictional effects in particular compressible flow problems. We'll talk about those for stream tubes later where we relax the assumptions of no heat transfer and no frictional effects. We can also trace out the Rayleigh and Fano flow lines. And you'll notice, of course, they all go from Y to X, but in different paths. Here's one more interesting picture of the thickness of a shock wave written in terms of the shock strength developed by Shapiro and Klein. The x-axis represents Mach number minus one, the Mach number in front of the shock, and it's written in a log scale. So very weak shocks are in the lower left part of the figure. Very strong shocks are in the lower right. So we're increasing Mach number and therefore increasing the shock strength. On the y-axis, we have the shock thickness in inches. And this is developed from theory and of course validated by measurement. We have the shock thickness in inches going from 10 to negative fifth all the way about to just under a tenth of an inch. So we're looking at about maybe a half a tenth of an inch, maybe one thirtieth or one fortieth tenth of an inch for a very, very weak shock. A very strong shock with M1 minus 1 for equal about 0.1, we'll have a shock thickness on the order of 10 to the negative 4 inches. So you can see the shock thickness decreases dramatically four orders of magnitude for a four order of magnitude increase of shock strength. In this class, we looked at particular stagnation properties across normal shock waves. We looked at P-naught, T-naught, and we can derive others from them for the stagnation properties. We then looked at particular graphs of normal shock waves for all the properties we derive. So you should be able to reproduce those graphs on say a test or homework and understand them physically. We then looked at the entropy increase of shocks and looked at why you can't have a subsonic Mach number in front of a standing normal shock. We then defined and looked at a number of parameters for the shock strengths themselves. And you could see clearly that indeed the shock strengths are often measured as a pressure rise for convenience or, according to some researchers, say the Mach number in front of the shock minus one. But you can use any property you wish to talk about shock strength. But just know that the pressure rise is the most common. Or talking about the Mach number in front of the shock is, of course, all the traditional equations are defined as a function of Mach number. We then looked very briefly at an order of magnitude analysis and a more detailed analysis using the Fonavier Stokes equations of Shapiro and Klein. And we saw that the shock thickness becomes extremely small for higher and higher and higher Mach numbers. And you can actually be on the order of a thickness of a human hair for a Mach number just above one. Then we looked at a single example, and we'll look more examples later. Thank you very much for your time today. I'm Professor Steve Miller.